Hello and welcome to a new lecture of the module Decision Making for Autonomous Robots here at the University of Bonn. Now before we start, this is the last lecture in this series and I would like to thank you for all your attention this far in the module and I really hope you enjoyed the content as well as learned something new. In this final lecture, we're going to look at problems of multi-robot planning and decision making. We're going to take what we have learned in previous lectures and extend it to applications where we have multiple robots and mo or multiple agents operating in the same environment and sharing the workspace rather than just one. So we start by looking at, first of all, what a multi-robot system is and different flavors of multi-robot planning and decision-making problems and based on this develop some general approaches um, to solving um, these tasks. And it's also worth mentioning that multi-robot planning is a very vast area of study and there are many different algorithms out there that focus on specific applications and specific problem setups. But in this lecture, we're going to try to keep it general and also um, focus on the things uh, that we need to understand to consolidate the ideas that we learned in previous lectures. Okay, so let's start by defining what is a multi-robot system or a multi-robot team. So a multi-robot system is a set of robots um, that's communicating, and collaborating, working together in order to um, perform a particular task in a shared environment. So here are some examples of multi-robot systems on the bottom, um, all of which are very different. So on the left we see an unmanned aerial vehicle, a UAV, and a ground vehicle that are working together on an agricultural field to perform environmental monitoring. So in this situation we could have different cameras equipped on these very different robots and we can study how can we fuse the information that we get from their cameras to collaboratively uh, build a map of the field and figure out uh, where the interesting plants are in the environment. And to take this a step further, we can even add additional functionality on one of the robots. So for example, the ground vehicle could be equipped with an end effector um, that it could use to perform intervention procedures on the field, such as weeding. So if the map that the robots create tells the ground robot where the weeds are, um, it can intelligently navigate there to perform these actions. But this obviously depends on um, the tandem of robots working together in order to achieve these uh, goals in this application. In the second example, we can see a very different application from an Amazon warehouse where we have a set of robots working for delivery applications. So here we have uh, different shells with goods and the robot's task is to pick up some of these goods that uh, people request and deliver it. And so the key question here is how can these robots schedule and allocate the resources, share the space effectively so that we as consumers can get our goods in the maximum, in the minimum amount of time. And finally, in the third example, we see a robot uh, collective construction application where we have a swarm of very simple, small robots, but many of them that are working together to build a structure. So each of these robots can deposit some material in the structure and by working together and building up the structure incrementally, uh, the robots can establish a very complicated uh, construction. And this is very similar and inspired by the way that ants or termites behave in nature. And so this is one bio-inspired example of a multi-robot system. And so why would we want to use a multi-robot system as opposed to a single robot system as we looked at in the previous lecture? So here's some advantages. So if we use multiple robots as opposed to just one, uh, the robots can spread out over the space more effectively and we can obtain typically better spatial distribution. So if you remember, we looked at um, in informative planning, placing sensors in an environment to take measurements. And obviously the more sensors we had, we could distribute them um, over the space that we were interested in taking measurements so that we can maximize the usefulness of those positions. 
And we have a very similar situation with multiple robots where if they're positioned very effectively, we can get a significantly more information than if we just had one robot, even if it was very fast, moving to collect measurements in that environment. That's one example where spatial distribution makes a significant difference and we would profit from using multiple robots. Another aspect is robustness. So if we have a single robot and it fails and it doesn't have any failure recovery mechanisms, um, our mission is over. Whereas if we have multiple robots and one of them fails, but the others can replace it or compensate for it in terms of actions, we get a much less vulnerable and more robust system to different types of failures. Um, thirdly, a multi-robot system could come potentially at a lower cost. So multi-robot systems tend to be more cost effective in some applications because if we have multiple robots uh, with different functionalities that are very uh, simple to construct and easy to program, this is typically cheaper than having one a very sophisticated robot to perform all the tasks that we need. Um, and finally, uh, multi-robot systems allow for a diverse range of applications. So if you look at example from the previous slide where we have our UAV and our ground vehicle working on the field, um, this intelligent type of behavior is very difficult to achieve with just a single robot because we benefit from the flexibility of the UAV as well as the heavy payload uh, of the ground vehicle so that it can carry the necessary end effectors and more detailed cameras for monitoring. So by designing our multi-robot system, we can uh, perform many more tasks than we would um, with just a single robot, potentially at a lower cost as well. However, as expected, multi-robot systems are also not without disadvantages. So one very significant disadvantage is computational complexity. In previous lectures, we already saw situations where planning and decision making with simply one robot is already very difficult, especially if we have limited onboard resources in terms of computation and we want to do online planning and in high dimensional um, configuration spaces. So these are some of the things that made uh, problems uh, computationally challenging to solve. Now, if we think about increasing the number of agents that we have in our problem, um, this can scale very badly because we have many more variables that we need to set and optimize uh, to achieve planning and decision making successfully. Uh, compounding that is the issue of communication. And so in situations where we want robots to communicate with each other, we need to think about uh, different aspects now that we don't have simply for a, a single robot case. For example, what about the bandwidth at which the robot uh, can communicate information? We need a way of selecting the most useful information to relay to other robots, as well as when to relay it. And this obviously highly depends on the communi um, communication um, uh, abilities associated with a particular application. So for example, if we have a search and rescue scenario where we have an unknown environment, and lots of debris, we might expect com um, communication to be unreliable at times. And so we need to design algorithms um, that account for this. In contrast, if we have the example of an agricultural field where we have a direct line of sight between the robots usually, this might not be such an issue, but it is something uh, to think about. And finally, the robots might interfere with each other simply uh, by construction of the problem because the robots have to share many resources. For example, in terms of communication and physical space, we need to be sure that they don't run into collisions with each other when they execute their plans. So all of these aspects um, and how to schedule the resources for each robot, how to communicate information simply compound to the already high computational complexity of multi-robot planning problems. And this is why it's generally difficult to design algorithms for these applications that work in all possible scenarios because there are very unique characteristics associated with each problem setup. And finally, 
From a practical point of view, the fact that we have multiple robots might also add to maintenance costs and efforts. Because multiple robots are simply harder to maintain, they might need repairs and so on. So this is, if we want to use these robots in real world scenarios, one potential uh, source of effort that we need to account for. If we think about replacing a single robot with a multi-robot system. So on the next slides, uh, what we're going to do is look at uh, different types of multi-robot um, problems that exist and try to classify them by developing a taxonomy. So we want to think about which type of problems exist and what do we want the robots to do in these problems. And then later on in this lecture, we're going to use this knowledge to develop approaches for solving multi-robot planning and decision-making problems. So starting with uh, the collective behavior of um, the multiple robots that uh, we're considering in our task. The way the robots work together could be either cooperatively or competitively. So in a cooperative scenario, the robots work together and depend on each other in order to accomplish a task. So we have some kind of global objective function that all of the robots are trying to work together to optimize. And in contrast, in a competitive scenario, the robots have conflicting goals and they need to compete against each other um, with respect to their own self-interest or with respect to their own objective functions. And so these are very two different uh, types of multi-robot uh, planning problems because on one hand, in cooperative environments, we want um, the robots to maximize a common utility function by working together um, and competitive environments want to try to predict what other robots would do based on their utility function and try um, to uh, counter that or get um, the most uh, maximize our own utility functions instead. So this is very similar to the types of uh, interactions we have with people too. And in this lecture, we want to focus on cooperative scenarios. And this is indeed how we defined our multi-robot system um, in the first slide, where the robots are working together and we have this one notion of uh, collective mission success. So one example of a cooperative scenario could be um, the UAV and the ground vehicle working together, whereas in competitive tasks, we could have something like um, football. Um, robot football where we have to score points against the other team but by definition the robots are still operating in the same environment and working in the same workspace. So we need to reason about other agents intentions. Um, another uh, element that we could add to our taxonomy is uh, communication. And so if we have a cooperative task where the robots work together they need to coordinate their actions. And coordination means how should the individuals schedule their own actions um, with respect to the common goal. Now the way that we achieve uh, coordination is through communication, just like people do. So we need to think about how can the robots communicate uh, with each other and to what extent. So we're going to disambiguate between two types of communication methods. On one hand, we have explicit communication, where there is a common medium the robots use for uh, communicating. So this could be like a wireless network, where each robot is passing messages over the network to each other. For example, it could be um, providing information about its intentions even, or the map that it created um, locally. And if we have such explicit communication, one consideration is the fact of bandwidth. Um, because we ca can't simply um, convey all the information uh, instantaneously to the other robot. So uh, explicit communication is typically associated with uh, bandwidth considerations. On the other hand, if we have implicit communication, this is a situation where the robots infer information about other robots through the environment itself. So we could have a common map that the robots are building together, for example, or we could have a robot that's observing the behavior of other robots in environment and trying to deduce things based on that. 
So a robot that's trying to imitate another robot doesn't necessarily need to have direct and deliberate information um, via explicit communication, but it can implicitly watch the other robot and determine what it's doing um, in order to copy it. So these are some examples of the different ways the robots could communicate with each other in a multi-robot system. Now more, moving further in our classification um, approaches, one concept that we want to introduce is um, the robot's architecture and how we actually do decision making um, with respect to that architecture. So this is a key aspect of how we will develop decision making approaches later. So we want to, again, distinguish between two types of um, ar robot architectures and approaches for decision making. So one of them is centralized. A centralized architecture has a central control agent for the multi-robot system. This could be a single robot or a single computer. And this um, control entity essentially receives all the information from the other robots and then uh, generate some kind of global plans or does global scheduling with respect to all that information. So there is a single uh, central point of coordination for the robots um, where the computation and the decision making is done. This is what we call a centralized approach. Now, as we will discuss later, centralized approaches uh, can be limited because they scale poorly with the number of robots. If you think about all the robots um, needing to pass information uh, to a single, to this single entity, th and um, this could lead to a very complex optimization problem um, because of the bottleneck associated with one single unit doing all the computation. And it could also be very vulnerable because if that central control unit fails, the multi-robot system has no other method of making the actual decisions. So for this reason, we introduce also decentralized um, architectures, which are the exact opposite. So in a decentralized um, multi-robot system architecture, or a decentralized approach, each robot is using its own local information in order to plan paths with very limited communication, if any, taking place. In this case, there is no central control agent that tells all the robots what to do, but the robots are making their plans locally by themselves, and typically there is some kind of coordination or collision avoidance uh, layer beyond that, um, so that the robots can actually schedule the resources. And here we also have either hierarchical um, architectures where we have a robot teams which could then have their own control unit or entirely distributed where each robot is uh, for themselves. And we'll go into more details about these two types of architectures later on in the lecture, but for now we want to introduce them and also think about um, the specifications of our multi-robot uh, planning and decision-making problem. And one final aspect that we want to consider is now how do we, as problem solvers, uh, formulate the problem of multi-robot planning and decision making. So there are several uh, things that we need to think about here and several choices that we have to make in terms of problem setup. <clears throat> so one of them, just like in single, single robot planning, is do we want to plan in discrete or continuous space? So remember, in discrete space, we have some underlying discretization of the environment and we allow the robots to move stepwise through it, constraining their actions to that particular grid or that discretization. Whereas in continuous space, uh, we allow the robots to take any action um, possible uh, given the problem domain, for example, planning in the space of trajectories. So again, depending on our problem, uh, we, we want to fixate on one of these two representations and this will obviously influence the quality of the plans that we get as well as the computational complexity. Um, another important um, aspect that we need to consider when designing um, our uh, solution methods for multi-robot planning and decision making is do we know our goals? 
So if we know uh, particular locations in the environment that we want the robot to go, then our problem is basically planning paths for each of these robots uh, to, uh, to reach one of these goals. So this is just like uh, the robot uh, planning problem that we considered at the very start of the module. If we know the goals, our problem is how do we, um, if necessary, how do we allocate these goals to the robots and how can they move there? If we don't know the goals, then we need to do decision making at a very high level and we have an additional layer of identifying where do we want the robots to go and following that we can answer the question of how do we actually get there with them. A very related um, aspect is do we have labeled or unlabeled goals if we have them? So this is very unique to the multi-robot setup. Um, Basically, what labeled means is that each robot is associated already uh, based on the problem specifications with a goal. So if we have a robot ID, we know we want that robot to move to a particular location. However, in an unlabeled scenario, we have a set of goals, um, as we see in the next slides, that are known and we need to figure out efficiently how can we get the robots uh, to these goals, but we don't necessarily care about which robot reaches which goal. So we have many more mappings and a more complex problem. And these two aspects will be illustrated on the next three slides. So the difference between the different types of uh, planning and decision making problems uh, depending on these specifications of the goals. Um, and finally, Again, we also come back to this later, is do we have a coupled or decoupled representation of the problem? So in a coupled scenario, we have a large uh, state representation that takes into account all the possible individual states of the robots. And we have one kind of big accumulation of all of the ro individual robot states and we try to optimize based on that. So we have some kind of joint problem there where we uh, consider all the robot states when we solve our problem. And in contrast, in a decoupled problem, um, already we can see that this is very, uh, the coupled uh, formulation is very, uh, it's reflecting the centralized strategy where we have a central control unit taking all the information. Um, in contrast, the decoupled strategy is one where we have individual robot states and we try to um, solve our problem uh, stepwise by um, tackling these individual sub-problems for each robot. So as we see later, these coupled and decoupled state representations are very related to our decision-making approach, uh, depending on how we process the information and perform the computations to solve the problem. So on the next slide, we're going to uh, zoom in to the goal part of the problem formulation and see how, what we want the robots to do in terms of reaching their goals in different scenarios. So here are three robots, just as a very simple um, illustrative example, and three goals or three locations that we want them to visit in the environment. So on a very basic level, the multi-robot uh, planning problem is how can we get these robots to reach these goals? So if we have known labeled goals, we have robots that simply plan paths to their assigned goals. So we want this robot to move to that goal and we apply um, a planning strategy, for example, um, search-based or sampling-based methods to drive the robot towards its goal. And if the robot reaches another goal, um, this doesn't satisfy our problem because we defined it as the robot needs to reach a unique goal. So this could be a, the, with the example again on the agricultural field of the UAV and the ground vehicle because the robots are very specialized in their actions and have very different uh, sensors and actuators. And so if another robot with very different capabilities reaches uh, the goal of um, yet another robot, then this would not be very useful for if the robot cannot execute the necessary action there. Um, so this is one situation um, if we have very specialized agents where the problem of known labeled goals uh, could be applicable. 
Now, if we want to uh, make the problem more complex, we could also consider uh, decision-making with known unlabeled goals. So now we have the goals that are known, but we don't care about which robot will reach which goal. So if we consider this robot here on the bottom, we need to consider all the possible goals that it can reach and do so for all the three robots and then figure out um, with respect to an objective function what is the best uh, scheduling strategy there. So here we have this additional layer of uh, so-called task allocation where we actually need to allocate each robot a goal. This is not given to us, not specified to us by the problem. So this problem is obviously more complex and um, an example of this would be if the robots need to inspect different uh, locations in the environment and they have exactly the same types of sensors. So it doesn't matter which robot reaches um, which location to inspect it. Most importantly is that all of the locations are visited and um, in classical uh, planning and decision making we care about the amount of time that it takes the robots to visit these goals. Now the most complicated problem that we can consider is one with completely unknown goals. And this uh, parallels our lecture on decision making exactly. Because we don't have a set of assigned goals in the environment, we're trying to figure out where they actually are. So here we have um, illustrated by the very uh, transparent stars our possible places where we could place our goals, say our measurement sites. And we need to say, well, if this robot um, could reach these locations uh, as candidates, how promising would it be uh, for the robot to go there and how much time would it take? And we need to do so now, not just for one robot, but for multiple <clears throat> and figure out um, the best possible combination of goals and paths for the robot to take to satisfy um, the unknown goal problem. Now here we might question ourselves, well, how do we say that one goal location is more promising than the other? Or how can we say that um, this robot should visit that goal and not this one? So here again, we have the concept of reward coming up, which is essentially a signal of telling us um, <clears throat> something about the mission success or the objective function of the problem. So this is application dependent. And uh, some examples are, for example, if we want the robots to explore the environment, one thing we could do is set the goals as frontiers and then plan paths so that each robot reaches the nearest frontier. And this way we could get a very rapid exploration and a very rapid coverage of an unknown environment if this is what we're interested in. Another goal could be uh, finding targets, for example. So if there are some targets in this environment, the robots need to cover it um, to figure out where they are as quickly as possible. We want the robots to go to promising locations where they could find the targets as quickly as possible. Another goal could be to maximize the map accuracy. So if we have a collective mapping scenario where we're fusing the measurements from each individual robots into the map, um, we could compute some kind of information measure um, over the current state of the map and then drive the robots to quickly uh, figure out where the promising locations are to improve the map quality with respect to that representation. And finally, uh, we come back to the example of having the robots collect measurements. So um, this is essentially the multi-robot version of the informative path planning that uh, we studied in the previous lecture, where we have robots taking some measurements in the environment and we need to decide how to distribute them to maximize the amount of information, the information value that we get uh, from these measurements if the robots were to go through those locations. So as we already um, understand from the example, planning with multiple robots is certainly not a trivial thing, especially if we have very complicated objective functions or rewards for the robots and we have uh, more than one agent. So in the next uh, part of the lecture, we're going to look at some approaches for solving these types of problems in terms of the classification we just looked at.
So now that we can appreciate the variance of the multi-robot planning and decision-making problem, um, we can go into more detail about how we can structure the problem and design solution methods based on that. Now, because the multi-robot problems are so complex due to the existence of multiple agents, the underlying assumptions that we make in the problem structure and the system architecture will significantly influence both the quality as well as the computational efficiency of our solution algorithms. So it's worth going into them in more detail. So in this part of the lecture, we cover different um, approaches to doing multi-robot planning and decision making. So we're going to focus on planning for the purposes of um, the slides. However, one can think about very similar strategies being used also for decision making problems where we have to decide where the robots should go and not only how they should get there as we do in planning. So in the next slides, we're going to cover centralized and decentralized um, planning strategies in more detail. So starting with centralized strategies, as we said in our taxonomy, this is when we have one individual single control unit, a robot or a computer, that takes all the information from the individual robots, does a computation, and produces a plan for them. Here we further distinguish between coupled and decoupled planning in terms of the robot state representation. So in coupled planning, we essentially concatenate the individual configuration spaces of the robots and the team, and we have a joint configuration space, a large problem that we're trying to solve with an optimization strategy in order to generate a plan for all the robots at the same time. And so essentially here, the state space of the individual robots is combined in um, the state space of a larger problem. And decoupled planning is significantly different because uh, we treat the robots individually plan paths for independent sub-problems, and then uh, we typically use some kind of coordination strategy to figure out how the robots can share the resources that they have um, effectively, for example, communication bandwidth, and also design algorithms for uh, collision avoidance because the robots are sharing the same workspace. Now, an alternative approach to centralized planning is decentralized planning. And this is where each robot is for themselves. The robots are completely independent. They take into account the local information they have about their context in order to generate individual plans. And then also we have some kind of coordination layer which manages the resources and ensures safe behavior of the robots in the shared environment. So the key difference for the purposes of this lecture that we want to point out between decoupled centralized and decentralized planning is in terms of where the computation is actually done. So in centralized planning, we uh, accumulate information for the individual robot subproblems in the central control unit, but in decentralized strategies, each robot is doing computation on board with their uh, dedicated uh, computational resources. So there's no concept of central control unit and passing information back and forth within it. Instead, um, we do planning from the perspective of the individual robot themselves. Now, these are just two extremes in terms of distributing the computation but many practical methods fall somewhere in between, and we call these hybrid approaches uh, for planning and decision making. So these are somewhere in between the spectrum, and in some of these cases, we can even adapt the behavior of the hybrid system to more centralized or decentralized behavior depending on what the mission calls for and what the requirements are. So one example that we'll be looking in in some detail is uh, market-based planning where we get the robots to try to auction off um, their plans and in, when deciding what to do next. So going more detail into centralized and coupled planning, as we said here, we have a central control unit and we're planning directly in the joint configuration space of the robots in the teams. So if we have a team with say K robots, the joint configuration space will be nothing but the Cartesian product of the individual robot uh, configuration spaces 
for 1 through k. And this way we develop one big problem from smaller individual subproblems from each robot by putting them together and concatenating them. And now one nice thing is that this gives us a very familiar problem structure where we just have one configuration space that we're trying to solve. And we can therefore use standard planning methods as we considered in the single robot planning lectures. For example, a search based strategy such as A-star or a sampling based strategy such as RRT in order to find a solution for the problem in the joint configuration space. And one nice thing about this idea as well is that we borrow the properties of the planner that we want to use. So for example, if we use A star, then we're guaranteed to find a complete solution in the joint configuration space um, by the nature of the search strategy. Remember, a complete planner is one that is guaranteed to find us a solution if it exists. However, not surprisingly, the main disadvantage of such centralized and coupled planning methods is computational complexity. Because if we think about robots with the same degrees of freedom, stacking an increasing number of robots in the joint configuration space will essentially call, cause the problem space to grow linearly with the number of robots. And therefore, if we're using a method such as A-star, which has computational complexity, um, exponential computational complexity, this will grow uh, based on the problem space rather rapidly, causing the problem to be computationally intractable even we ha when we have a rather small number of robots in the team. And this is the key issue that hinders us from using a coupled centralized planning approaches when we have um, multiple robots also in large configuration spaces. So one idea that we have um, an alternative approach is to use decoupled planning. And decoupled planning is based on the key concept that smaller problems are easier to solve uh, than one large problem. So what we want to do in a couple of decentralized uh, planning is a two-phase approach. So first we look at each robot locally and individually and plan a path for them separately. So here we don't put the configuration spaces together, we treat each robot's individual configuration space and find a solution to that subproblem. And then what we do is we use a coordination strategy to coordinate the individual plans. This could involve, for example, resolving conflict in terms of the way the robots are using their communication resources and avoiding collisions in the environment the robots are operating in. So <clears throat> um, coordination strategies can also be either online or offline. So online coordination refers to the coordination actually being done during the mission as the robots are moving. So one example could be a very simple reactive collision avoidance, where it's if a robot detects it's, it's in collision with another, another robot, it takes an evasive action. And in contrast, an offline coordination strategy is one that is pre-computed before the mission begins. So we compute the local plans for each robot, we put them together in the central control unit, and we figure out how to resolve any conflicts that might arise um, from these individual plans in an offline way. And then we adjust the plans if necessary, and we pass them to the robots um, in order to uh, execute the mission. However, the main problem with a decoupled centralized planning strategy is that the solution to the individual subproblems for each of the robots in the team does not necessarily correspond to the best global solution for the entire um, ensemble of robots. And therefore, even if we use a complete and optimal methods for the first planning phase and the second coordination phase, we're not guaranteed to get a complete and optimal solution to the entire problem as a whole. And so to illustrate this, here is one classical example from literature where we have uh, two robots that are positioned in a particularly bad way uh, for decoupled centralized planning. 
So here the robots are in some kind of narrow passageway with walls in between. We have a pink uh, robot and a yellow one. And starting from the initial configuration, we simply want them to uh, change uh, swap positions. So as humans, we know for this type of interchange to take place, we need to take the robots out from this narrow passageway and replace them step by step. But because each robot is planning individually, what local uh, decoupled planning tends to get, do is get stuck here because it doesn't have any contextual knowledge of the intentions and the plans of the other robot and it can't appreciate this type of um, behavior that's necessary to cause this replacement. So if we have such situations in our problem space, a decoupled uh, strategy tends to suffer and this is where we might run in, in, into issues due to it uh, being incomplete and suboptimal in most cases. Now, uh, what kind of coordination strategies can we use in the second phase? This is a key question. So there are many several, uh, there are many methods proposed in the literature as to how we can do this either in an online or in an offline way. So one strategy is to give the robots some priority in terms of the plans that they have computed. So for example, if we have a robot that planned a particularly long path um, to achieve the next uh, goal, or if we have a robot with many obstacles um, and local clutter in its environment, we might want to place greater priority to that robot in order to give it enough time and resources it needs to execute its task and um, uh, contribute to the goal of the multi-robot team. And similar alternative thing we could do is rank the robots and perform um, some sort of scheduling. So if we see that the paths of two robots are crossing over, for example, once they have been computed locally, we can figure out um, a scheduling strategy so that the robots do not move at the same time, but we wait for one to actually complete its plan before proceeding to the second. Decoupled centralized planning is, um, shares many uh, similarities with decentralized planning. So a decentralized planning architecture is one where there is absolutely no central control unit and all the information is processed on the individual robots based on their local information. And this method tends to be computationally efficient. It's also, um, like the couple planning, it benefits from tackling individual subproblems for each robot. And also very robust because we don't rely on a centralized uh, control unit to generate the plan. So if there's a failure in the system, as we said, um, there's a higher likelihood of the rest of the robots being able to complete the mission successfully. However, because we don't have all the global information when we're doing the plans, only the robot local information, just like the couple planning, these methods tend to be suboptimal. And there might be different types of communication that exist in decentralized strategies, uh, which could be implicit or explicit. But typically, in decentralized planning, we try to limit um, communication. In terms of coordination strategies for the second layer, just like in decoupled planning, we could use, uh, for example, local replanning to perform collision avoidance. So on the right here, we can see example of a team of two UAVs uh, coordinating in the space to pick up objects and deposit them at a location outside the field of view of this image. So there are several kinds of targets that the robots need to find, pick up and deposit um, at a location. This could be uh, relevant, for example, for a search and rescue or delivery scenario, this type of problem setup. So what these robots do is that they generate the local plans um, individually and the strategy that one uses for collision avoidance is uh, tracking the global position of uh, the other robots and then if necessary performing using uh, the robot controllers very local adjustments to the path in order to avoid collisions. So the robots are not communicating their intentions uh, to each other. We're only sharing the global post through a communication network 
uh, which is then rather lightweight. And we can also think about using, in this particular example, different strategies to avoid collisions between the robots. So for example, if we have a large area with multiple robots, we can um, allocate one of the areas to each robot so that their workspaces interfere as little as possible, only when they need to um, either uh, drop, uh, drop off or pick up objects in this example. So if we have a large space, we can partition, partition it and allocate one robot to each area, also perhaps fixating unique heist in order to minimize the likelihood of collisions happening and then adding this extra safety layer of local replanning by sharing the global pose to avoid uh, local uh, collisions. Now those are two extremes of centralized and decentralized planning. What about hybrid planning? Well, hybrid planning is essentially in between where we have uh, some concept of centralized planning, but not everything is necessarily going to that central control unit. So one method of hybrid planning that's commonly used in practice is so-called uh, market-based planning. And marketplace planning is interesting, um, is based on the ideas of free market, where there is an auction as to which robots should execute the plan, and we need to somehow coordinate them. So typically, uh, we have uh, limited shared resources that are shared with the robots, and each robot has to make a bid based on the utility they could get from getting that resource and the cost that it will take them. And then we look at the bids of each individual robot and we give the contract or the auction goes to the robot which has the best uh, ratio of utility to cost. So rather than sending all the information about the robots to a central control unit, now we have robots place a bid and um, then we give them permission to execute the task if they're the highest bidder. Using such an approach, we can also think about uh, coordinating robots and teams, where we have sub-teams, um, especially in the case of Swarm, where there are very many robots, um, sub-teams with a leader who acts as the centralized unit, um, but we don't have a centralized unit for the entire team as a whole, only individual parts. And then we manage the resources on that level within sub-teams. So, Again, there is some element there of centralized control on the level of sub-teams, but not on the team as a whole. So here's an example of how a market-based strategy could work on, uh, in the case of space exploration. So over here we see uh, three robots in the different colors, and the circles represent um, sites that they need to inspect on this, um, in this landscape. So each robot in a market-based strategy would say, this is the potential value that I could get if I went to inspect that point in terms of measurements. And this is the cost, for example, how long it will take me to get there, or what is the length of my path. And then we need to look at um, these parameters for each of the three robots, and then based on that decide which one will get the inspection site that they placed a bid for. To make things more concrete, in the final part of the lecture, we cover a state-of-the-art algorithm for decentralized multi-robot planning and decision-making applications. And this algorithm is based on the ideas of Monte Carlo tree search and also supports a variety of general objective functions. So for example, we can define utility functions for our robots to focus on exploration or informative planning for environmental monitoring. This specific approach also aligns very well with the content we covered in previous lectures and serves as a nice review, and also has several practical benefits that are useful in real-world applications. So before we get into uh, multi-robot aspects, uh, let's quickly recap what is Monte Carlo tree search, uh, taking a slide from our previous lecture. So we use Monte Carlo tree search as a strategy for doing robot decision making in very large um, search spaces. 
So essentially, we considered a completely observable Markov decision process where the robot knows its state and has to take some actions uh, based on a reward function to decide uh, what to do next. And the way that we dealt with this problem uh, using Monte Carlo tree search is to build a search tree of state action sequences and then figure out essentially which are the promising branches of this tree. To construct the search tree we use sampling. So starting from a root node um, here in the white um, at the top of the tree we can sample an action or a black node here um, that the robot should take and we end up in some new state. And then we can trace different state action sequences, um, different branches on the tree to a termination state um, and figure out what is the reward or what is the gain we obtain for the mission if the robot executes that particular branch or does those actions. So we call this procedure and the terminology of Monte Carlo tree search rollout. So this is where we essentially simulate episodes and figuring out which are the most promising branches of the search tree to find the best solution. And in the lecture we also said that in order to determine which parts of the tree to explore or to exploit, we use this upper confidence bound which allows us to manage between um, exploring unknown parts of the tree, picking totally new actions and seeing if they lead to promising behavior, and exploiting actions that we already know are good. So if we have a simulator and we do enough rollout episodes, Monte Carlo tree search by the nature of sampling is a very efficient way of overcoming um, a very uh, computational complexity of very complicated problems and obtaining, uh, finding good reward sequences. So decentralized Monte Carlo tree search is uh, using this idea in order to uh, figure out the best uh, paths probabilistically over uh, different agents' future sequences. So we're just going to briefly cover the approach that's presented in this recent paper. The algorithm itself is called uh, Decentralized Monte Carlo Tree Search or DEC MCTS and much more details can be found in the journal paper. So we're going to try to connect these ideas of Monte Carlo tree search to a single robot application and see what additional considerations we need when we extend this uh, to a decentralized setup with multiple agents. So the idea behind, um, as we said, behind DEC MCTS is to do probabilistic reasoning over different actions of the agent and figuring out um, which is the best possible actions. Remember, because the algorithm is decentralized, we need such a search tree for every agent that is in the team. And we'll see exactly how this fits in on the next slide. So what is the main advantage of using this uh, DEC MCTS? So what benefits does it bring? So because uh, just like in reinforcement learning, we had this reward signal, um, that tells us how promising uh, potential state action sequences are of the robot. When we do decision making, we can uh, transfer these ideas to this decentralized problem and simply change the objective function. So the objective function in this multi-robot planning is something that we pick, we define. For example, it can be the value of the measurements that we collect in an information gathering scenario, and the amount of space that we uncover in an unexplored environment. So we can essentially define this reward ourselves when we do the Monte Carlo tree search and thus apply the same general algorithm in a variety of scenarios. This is one of its advantages. And secondly, because we're continuously exploring the search tree, we're continuously performing this rollout, the simulation of episodes, the approach is essentially anytime. Anytime simply means that we can uh, terminate if we have limited, limited com computational resources and extract the solution that we have performed so far, uh, that we have um, obtained so far. So we don't need to wait for the algorithm to complete extensively. It's suitable for online and real-time applications as well due to its anytime nature. Also because of its uh, decentralized structure, this approach, uh, DEC MCTS, is rather robust. 
So remember, it is uh, resilient against um, infrequent communication or failures of the individual agents because all the computation is done on board uh, the single robot. And finally, um, because of its asynchronous nature as well as decentralized structure, uh, one of the key attractive features of this method is that it's also scalable to large robot teams. So we can see in the experiments in this paper that it's able to handle much uh, more quickly larger configuration spaces and larger teams as, to, as compared to centralized strategies. So this gives us some motivation for combining this decentralized structure with this MCTS um, method that we use for general decision making. So what are some of the key steps if we want to apply uh, Monte Carlo tree search to a decentralized setup with multiple agents? So here's the procedure, which we go through in detail next. So we have a search tree, just like we did in the single agent Monte Carlo tree search, um, from the perspective of a single robot. Except this time, when we perform the rollout of the tree, we also need to reason about the actions of the other agents. So we need to somehow predict what the other agents will do when we perform this rollout, the simulation. So we grow the tree using rollout with respect to the robot's plans. That's the first step. And then we have some probability distribution, and this is the key insight of the multi-agent um, part of the problem. We have a probability distribution that allows us to reason over what the agents will do next. So we define some domain over possible plans, next plans for the agents, and then we assess based on the state of our search tree and knowledge from the other agents what that probability distribution looks like. We can then communicate this probability distribution to the other agents in the team if we have communication protocols and also receive um, through the protocol uh, what the other agent uh, probability distributions over different action sequences are to account for, for the next step when we're growing our search tree. So this procedure visually uh, looks something like this. So here are the three key steps where we have first growing the search tree. So on the search tree, just like in normal Monte Carlo tree search, we sample the robot's actions and we're trying to reason over what the other agents, the other robots might also do during the rollout phase. So here in green, we can see some examples of rollout, the next actions that are sampled, and the tree essentially getting bigger and branching out as we're doing the rollout procedure. And in orange, um, as we discuss later, we see uh, the best nodes that are selected based on our notion of reward and our objective function. This is something that we define. And then we pick some um, nodes in the search tree uh, corresponding to action sequences, and we develop a probability distribution over them. Then we can essentially update this probability distribution based on the information that we get from other agents as well as based on what we uh, grew in the search tree. So this is some uh, belief that the agent has regarding what can possibly happen next in the environment with the other agents. And the third step is communication, where the robot interchanges this information about the probability distribution as to what the next action sequences are. And so importantly, one might question when we're growing the search tree and performing um, the rollout, just like we do in the standard Monte Carlo tree search, what would be our objective function that now encapsulates multiple agents rather than just one? And previously, um, we considered objective functions uh, based on a single agent's actions, and now we also have to bake in the possible behaviors of the other agents as well. And so we define a so-called local utility function for the robot. So this is something that tells us about uh, the next actions of the robot. Because remember, we're growing the search tree with respect to a single robot's actions. It's a decentralized strategy, and uh, each robot is growing its own search tree uh, 
assessing the next actions for itself. And um, we encapsulate uh, within the rollout phase the simulations of the other robots. So we have a local robot utility function based on its own actions that's based on a global objective here, G. The global objective is the value that we get if the robot takes an action and the other robots take some other actions. So that's how we can evaluate how promising different action sequences are uh, during the rollout phase. So we look at if the robot took an action corresponding to a branch of the tree and ended up in a state, and the other robots took their own actions, we can um, put these variables into the global utility function and see how useful those are, depending on what our mission objective is, whether it's exploration or uh, envi me taking measurements in environmental monitoring and data acquisition. So the robot's local utility function, here f, is based on the global uh, function, which is an abstraction about our mission objective, accounting for the robot's next action uh, selected from the search tree, as well as the other robot's actions considered from the rollout. And we also um, then uh, subtract the fact that the, what would happen if the robot that's growing the search tree, so the local robot is staying idle. So if the, all the other robots took the exact same actions, but robot R, our robot that's growing the search tree, essentially did nothing. And the reason why they do this, as explained in the paper, is to focus more the utility on the local agent's actions. So this is um, some trick in the objective function that one does um, in order to focus uh, the value of gain, of the value of the reward, with respect to the local agent. So we have a local robot utility function here that's essentially the difference between a candidate action for the robot. This is something that we're trying to optimize to figure out what the best action is, minus the act of doing nothing. This is like a uh, reference. And then um, we take the best possible nodes, those are the orange ones in our search tree with respect to that local reward, and we figure out what is the possibility, what is the probability of these action sequences actually happening. So we take these nodes that we found are the best in the search tree, and we associate them with probabilities um, over the action sequences um, mapping to the nodes. So with each branch, we have a sequence of the robot's local actions as well as the other robot's actions, and now we want to associate them in a probabilistic way. So over here we can see an example um, with the dotted uh, red and the blue of the action sequences being dynamically updated when the robot receives new information from the other agents and performs its rollout. So this happens based on the information that we get from the um, act of expanding the search tree and evaluating its branches, as well as the information that the other robots give. And this is why we have these um, arrows coming in with uh, connecting the information flow between the different agents. And so in such a way we can use um, the search tree in a decentralized way, executing a search tree on each individual robot and using this um, action sequence probability a schematic to also reason about the actions of the other agent as well as the robot that's that we actually want to control via the search tree. And so a lot more details about the actual algorithm is described in the paper, but the key thing to take away here is how we actually brought in together different elements of what we have covered in previous lectures in terms of Monte Carlo tree sampling decision-making in the utility function and the decentralized multi-robot setup in order to design this uh, complete architecture that allows the robots um, to communicate and coordinate their behavior with respect to each other. So um, the paper also presents many experiments. And so one of the results that is shown is for the so-called generalized team orienteering problem. 
where we have different robots um, corresponding to the different colors here. So these are some example trajectories that the robots executed um, by running this algorithm. So remember, each robot is decentralized. It communicates only these uh, probabilities with respect to each other and also keeps track of its own search tree. And the objective here of this uh, generalized team orienteering problem is say we want to visit or register a lot of these uh, green circles in the environment and we have some obstacles. So how should the robots move with a limited budget in order to uh, touch as many of these green circles as possible if we have multiple agents? So this is one um, evaluation method and experimental setup of how we can assess what the algorithm is actually doing. So the objective is to collect the green circles given the number of robots that we have and their limited um, budgets. So what was done in the paper is that um, they ran many trials uh, for the decentralized and decentralized version for decentralized and centralized versions of the Monte Carlo tree search algorithm. And remember, remember a centralized algorithm essentially does all the processing in a central control unit, whereas in the decentralized case we have uh, this very localized um, procedure for each robot where communication is only happening with respect uh, to the probability distributions of the possible action sequences. So over here, we can see some metrics. Uh, These are typical plots that can be found in uh, planning and decision-making papers where we try to compare performance and communication robustness. So on the left, we can see um, the time taken, the computation time during a mission, if we have a limited budget over uh, 120 uh, seconds here. And then the yellow line essentially shows the centralized baseline, such that if we have bars um, that are over the line, the decentralized method is doing better. So this is like a relative plot that's, show, uh, that's comparing performance between the two methods. So the yellow is the baseline, centralized with the central control unit, whereas um, the box plots show uh, different quartiles plotting the statistics over the trials for the decentralized method. And on the y-axis, what we do is compare the reward uh, that one obtains using um, these two methods. And the right experiment shows um, similar. On the y-axis, we compare the reward. The yellow is, again, the centralized baseline. And on the x-axis, we try to plot what is the probability of failure or packets being dropped when the robots are communicating with respect to each other. So we want to see how the decentralized and centralized algorithms are doing against each other comparatively with respect to these metrics. So on the left plot, comparing performance, that's the reward over the mission time with the limited budget. We can see that even relatively early on in the mission, we have more boxes appearing above the yellow baseline, so the algorithm is being able to coordinate the, robot be the robots better by treating them independently and obtaining um, higher reward. And on the, on the right, we see for the communication robustness that even with limited communications, for example, 94% communication loss, so that's the robots communicating and actually dropping 94% of the packets, the decentralized method does better. And this is because um, the decentralized um, system architecture allows for robustness and less vulnerability when communication um, goes poorly. So obviously when communication fa uh, failure probability is exceptionally high, then we don't have any communication at all between the agents and we can collect less reward because the agents are essentially entirely independent. So with this algorithm, Monte Carlo Tree Search, uh, the fact that some uh, communication is feeding back to optimize for the probabilities of action sequences, um, this step is necessary, it's just that we can tolerate quite a large proportion of a mispackage and communication failure because the algorithm is decentralized. So this is 
Again, one example of a practical state-of-the-art uh, decentralized algorithm and a way of doing multi-robot uh, planning and decision-making in various scenarios. There are many other algorithms out there and it's strongly encouraged, uh, depending on the application at hand, um, to look at what can be done. Obviously, the first step is to look at the constraints, the environment that the robots are operating in, any communication or platform-based constraints that they have, and then based on that, uh, design the best uh, multi-agent uh, coordination collaboration strategy. So with this example um, algorithm, uh, we come to the end of the lecture and the module as a whole. So in this lecture, we looked at multi-agent systems. We defined and we motivated why we would want to use multiple robots in some applications as opposed to just a single one. And then we looked at um, a taxonomy of multi-agent planning and decision-making and used that to design some approaches for decision-making from a general point of view. Importantly, we distinguish between centralized and decentralized planning architectures and also touched on hybrid structures um, such as market-based uh, strategies. And finally, to make things uh, very concrete with a specific example of an algorithm, we looked at decentralized Monte Carlo tree search, which is a method for um, doing robotic planning and decision making with multiple agents um, custom objective functions and uh, using a decentralized system architecture for enhanced robustness. So that's all for this lecture. There are many uh, surveys on multi-robot applications and further readings that one can do. Um, as mentioned before, it really depends on the problem at hand. Um, but these are some of the papers that um, some of them are fairly recent that one can recommend uh, to read. Finally, I would like to thank you again for watching these videos for decision making for autonomous robots at the University of Bonn. I hope you enjoyed these videos as much as I enjoyed making them. It has been a real pleasure and I appreciate all the feedback and the engagement with the content and looking forward to more in the future.